In the name of our living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we've just heard the story of Thomas, and Thomas was um, uncertain about the identity of Jesus. And we're going to be thinking about Thomas and his doubt, but also about the marks and the wounds uh, that are associated with the cross. And then we're going to be looking at some different sorts of crosses. And because this is our normal Wriggle Sunday, I'd like to say good morning or good afternoon to all our children and to all our parents and to all of our parishioners who are able to watch this in this way. Well, we're going to continue our celebrations with Easter today uh, because it's a 50 days of Easter, so we've got plenty of time. We've got the Paschal candle up, for example, and we've got some beautiful gold flowers, and the church is wearing white and gold. On this Sunday, it's sometimes called Low Sunday, we see Thomas in genuine doubt. He is, he is really puzzled, and he wants to ask questions, and that is completely normal to ask questions. But I wonder if Thomas, and even the others, recognise God's his incredible outpouring of love on the cross. Because all the disciples were really, really struggling with Jesus as he's now revealed as their saviour. But they could see him, that Jesus' body had all these wounds all over him. How could they know the cost of that, the profound love of God through Jesus the crucified? And Thomas was needing to be assured. He wanted to, he really wanted to see for himself. Even though Jesus said, blessed are those who see, uh, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. In other words, to believe with sight unseen. Thomas doesn't want to accept that. He wants to see it for himself. And in a sense, Thomas is a bit blind. He doesn't see with the eyes of faith. And that's what we all sometimes need, is to be able to see with the eyes of faith. That would be really, really fantastic. But you know that Jesus doesn't even reprimand Thomas. He doesn't say, he doesn't scold Thomas. In fact, what would be the point of reprimand? Why punish him when he's just asking questions? Instead, Jesus offers himself. He offers himself his hands his feet, the marks of where the thorns have been on his head and where the, where, the, where the sword had got through him all pierced. He offers him to him. That's all he does. And perhaps Jesus really wants Peter to confront the grim reality of his crucifixion. Just like it, even though it's so hard, it is about facing the grim reality of crucifixion. And we might have seen on our Q bulletin, you might have seen it's a kind of modern day Jesus where Jesus is um, having his side inspected very, very carefully uh, by his disciples and they're wearing kind of leather jackets. So that's a modern day Jesus. Thomas's doubt, you see, is also our doubt. It's good to ask questions, and it's really important that we make inquiries. Otherwise, we'd never learn, would we? Children, at various parts of their growing up, keep asking questions all day long. My mum tells me that when, that's exactly what I was like all day long. Poor mum. This is how children learn and explore. And Anglicanism encourages curiosity. In fact, Anglicanism and the doubt of Thomas are very closely intertwined because asking questions is inherent in our faith development. Thomas's questioning is an, an important metaphor for our growth in faith. Christ touched many people's wounds in his life, in his ministry. Sometimes he touched people with his hands. 
sometimes with his actions, because sometimes actions are louder than words, and sometimes it was he touched people with his words. He was, to use the phrase coined by Henry Nouwen, the wounded healer. Though despised and feared, and though cast out and crucified, Christ demonstrated preparedness to be alongside people wherever they were. The last time we had a regal service, we talked about the woman at the well, and she was being given the gift of living water by Jesus. Jesus gets to the heart of the matter about her life and her need for this water. And Jesus touches the woman with his words, with his truth. And Annalise gave a beautiful, really moving, excellent address about this and how huge this was for this woman to be given life-giving water. Jesus was offering life-giving water, so Jesus was touching this woman with his words, words of hope and life. This Easter season, I'm asking all of us, especially in the context of the novel coronavirus pandemic across the globe, all of us to, to reach out appropriately social, physically distant, but to reach out to people and to be this agent of healing, even though sometimes we might be scared and frightened ourselves, is to be agents of healing in the things that we can do. Because it's only the small things that sometimes that make the most difference. Now, especially I wanted children to see if they could find some things, maybe in their backyard, maybe on one of the walks while they go exercising outside during this uh, lockdown period. And what I'd really like to do is just to see if children and families and perhaps other people could make their own cross. And this is an idea, this is just two uh, little sticks that we made the mobiles with that time. And you can take some twine and basically, um, maybe I might just, I'd like to introduce my husband, Father Philip, and he's just gonna come up down the side here. Um, he's very clever at making things. But you can take a little hook thing like that, <clears throat> here he comes, and maybe tie it over. Hello, Father Philip. Hello, Mother Jenny. Oh no, you use the hook like that and then thread it through <laughs> like that, up through there. Right. Yeah. So to just being able to tie that up, we live in the same household, by the way, so that's why we... So what I did, I went into the backyard and I got some silver birch and these are just ordinary twigs and uh, I got some, I actually got some beautiful black uh, twine and I made that. It's sort of earthy, it's not perfect um, and you can also use some more twine just to tighten up those ends if you wanted to like that. How are we going? Is yeah, good? is it all sort of tied up now? We show, just show a little bit closer. So there's a couple of ideas. Thank you. And there's also a few ideas uh, on the back uh, of what I sent to people. Uh, there's some ideas there and they're quite similar. There's twigs and there's even some driftwood and someone made an Easter tree as well. All sorts, and they can use rubber bands as well to tie pieces up. So see if you can make that. I want to give you now just a little, a couple of um, different, different a story about different sorts of crosses because there's such an um, intrinsic part of our of our faith and our worship. Just about everything we wear has got a cross on it. That's a kind of Maltese cross, um, and that's got red velvet. This one is of uh, Father Philip. He's been presented with a cross, which was made specially for Melbourne Assessment Prison by the person on uh, the left-hand side. And that was presented, and that beautiful, huge cross. And this is a Latin cross. It's where the, um, the vertical arm is longer and the, the horizontal band or um, is slightly smaller. And that's a kind of classic sign. And you see behind me the cross of St Albans here. That's also in the same 
a similar proportion where the width is slightly uh, shorter than the height. The symbolism of um, the cross also can be likened to if you spread your arms out, you are reaching out to others and connecting with others. And then when you get the vertical line, you're connecting and reaching God. So there's the vertical, reaching to the divine, and reaching out to humanity. One of my really um, in interests is in all sorts of different crosses, but I seem to have received over the years uh, three crosses which are called a Jerusalem cross. And a Jerusalem cross is one where the arms are equal in length and width, and there's little crosses, uh, four little crosses. And that stands for north, south, west, and east. That's called a Jerusalem cross. And there's two other examples here of Jerusalem crosses where they are equal and they've got interesting, the rounded in the middle, north, south, west, and east, reaching out. This cross is called a Tau cross, T A U, and that's associated with um, a monastery and order. And this cross is an unusual one, but that's associated with people who walk on pilgrimages and they're little markers on the tree uh, or on lampposts. And when pilgrims make their way around, they see one of these shells on the cross and they know they're on the, on the right path. This is a beautiful cross. It's called a holding cross. And you can hold it and think of God's love in Jesus Christ. And it brings, because it's made to fit your hand, it's a great comfort for people, especially when they might be sick or afraid or in hospital, or they might be getting ready for an operation or recovering some from a procedure. So that's a holding cross. Philip gave that to me when I celebrated my 30th anniversary as deacon. This Jerusalem cross, by the way, was actually from Jerusalem. And that was a gift from my mother. Here's the difference between a crucifix and a cross. You see the cross behind us? That's an ordinary cross. But these are called crucifixes. And the difference is that these actually show a representation of Jesus on the cross. This one's also from Jerusalem, and that has Mother of Pearl. And this one was a gift that I gave to someone, and when that person died, they put it in the will back to me. This cross uses nails. It's very simple, but it's um, quite poignant, isn't it, when you think about the cross and the nails. When Father Philip and I were in Uluru, we did some dot painting and it was a class that we attended. And this one here that I did depicts two different kinds of crosses. This one here with the red, the red blood coming down, that depicts the crucifixion. And here on the left hand side is the illuminated cross and it's got sparks coming all out of it and that stands for resurrection. Quite often you see Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art depicting both uh, crucifixion and resurrection through their crosses. And finally, the cross that I wear the most personally, this cross is made by my late father and it is um, a simple cross. It was made by my father and the wood that he used to make this was from the property uh, in far western New South Wales where I grew up and that is very very special to me. Now Father Philip is going to um, join me here, he's going to tell me a little bit about the amazing uh, revelation that is in churches that we really can't see. Thank you Mother Jenny. Well I have uh, a hobby and you may have noticed, you may have been able to see this beautiful model of the Cathedral of Santa Maria it's in Florence in Italy, and you can see the, the beautiful dome 
and the tower and this building here is the baptistry there and and uh, I can really recommend it. it's a wonderful hobby to be able to build these things but why I wanted to show it to you today is not because of all the beautiful things that we might see when we look at the building on the outside but to talk about the overall shape of the building when you turn it up like that, oh. you can see that even from the air, it's in the shape of a cross, a Latin cross, as Mother Jenny was talking about before. So you can think of those amazing architects working hundreds of years ago, uh, even thought that they would have the symbolism of, of the cross at the very heart of the architecture of these beautiful buildings. Thank you, Mother Jenny. Thank you, Father Philip. Well, we may just stand here, but I'm just noticing here in St Albans, um, if we go down there, down the aisle, and we come all the way, we go all the way down to the back to, to the chapel of St George, actually that's, that's the long arm, isn't it, yes. of a cross? Yes, that's right. And then what do you think about the width? Well, that would be the short arms. Yeah. yeah. So St Albans itself has this puzzle or mystery revealed inside. And I imagine if we were a bird looking down, we'd also see the shape of a cross. That's right. And quite often you might see some people making the sign of a cross, Father Philip. Um, quite often as we started the, the gospel reading or the homily um, or at the confession, the absolution, we make the sign of the cross. And I was thinking, oh, Thomas would relate to this because he could see the the crown of thorns, the nails yes. in his feet, and, and then a nail in each of his hands, and of course that wound in his side. That's right. And that's what we still do today, isn't it? It is, yes. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and we make the sign of the cross, not because it's some kind of religious voodoo, it's because we're marking ourselves with the sign of the cross and holding in tender gratitude the wounds of our Lord, but we always, as Anglicans, celebrate the risen Lord and the empty cross. Children, parents and parishioners, I hope this is a blessed time of Easter and I hope that whatever doubts you have in your lives, you may know that you may come to our Lord wounded but risen. May the Lord be with you. And so with you. Thank you.